Lacey, let's go. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Lacey. Um, Thanks for having me. No, it's a pleasure. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's honestly my pleasure. So you study brown dwarfs. What is it? Yes. There's just I have so many questions about this. This is my first time having a conversation with someone that's studying, essentially studying planets from beyond Earth. So. Can you tell us before diving into more of like the trying to understand what are drawn, drawn, brown dwarfs, can you tell us a bit about you? What is it that got you into actually getting into this field of studies? Yeah, so I was actually raised by a single dad with the help of my grandparents, and I grew up in rural Indiana. And so we didn't have a lot of money, but my dad would take us camping. And so my sister and I and my dad, we would go camping. And I just remember looking up at the stars. I feel like every person who loves space has this cliche story and I have the same story, but it just looking up at the stars at night when it was very dark, I thought it was very interesting. And even though I'd always loved space, I really wanted to pursue a career in it when I got into elementary school and got a little bit older because even in my small hometown, we had something called the Challenger Learning Center. And it was this really interesting, um, like a hands-on educational center that also did outreach where your class would come in and you would actually simulate a space, sh um, a space shuttle mission And so um, the class is broken into these little groups and you would get to be on the navigation team or the science team. And just even though it was all pretend and you would go in an airlock, but really it was just a revolving door in the dark. Like it really felt as if you were boarding some kind of space shuttle. And I, I, I think that's what solidified it. So you kind of went all the way because now you're a PhD candidate literally doing research on brown dwarfs. What is it that got you there? Why and why brown dwarfs specifically out of this every field you could have studied? I know. Um, I think brown dwarfs are very interesting. I actually started undergraduate as an atmospheric science student, and I really wanted to study severe weather. But um, I had my passion for space, of course, but I just was really drawn to atmospheres mm -hmm. and no one else in my family went to college. And so I wasn't really aware that there was a field of planetary sciences that had been coming into view more so in the last few decades. So I think it was my junior year of undergrad. I realized that I could study atmospheres on other planets. And I thought, oh, okay, that's what I want to do. And um, brown dwarfs, I had to give a talk for a stellar evolution class. It was my senior year, I think. And I was doing research on these objects, and I thought that their clouds were very interesting because the clouds on brown dwarfs are composed of things like iron and mm. corundum, which is the raw form of rubies and sapphires. And I thought, wow, I mean, on Earth, we only have water clouds, but on these objects, clouds can be made of silicates. Mm. And so I really, really wanted to pursue some kind of research to study them. So brown dwarfs are basically, from the research I did, they're basically failed stars. They're... What's how what what is the process uh, where a star fails to become a star and actually becomes a brown, a brown dwarf? Can you take us through the process for the people that are hearing this term for the first time? Yeah, it's funny that they're called brown dwarfs because they're not actually brown. <laughs> um, okay. But I guess there weren't any names left. But they are going to be less massive than a low mass star, like a red dwarf, but they're more massive than a gas giant like Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of, brown dwarfs are, are that connection or that bridge between high mass planet formation and low mass star formation. And typically brown dwarfs are considered 13 Jupiter masses to around 80 Jupiter masses, but mm -hmm. you know, those lines are a little blurry, but we, um, 
we believe they form like stars. And so when you have a molecular cloud of gas and dust that's collapsing, it just um, essentially doesn't become massive enough and warm enough to ignite hydrogen fusion. And so mm-hmm. a brown dwarf forms and it can't, it can't fuse. And so it just cools for the rest of its lifetime. And then it just floats out there in space. Slowly dying. Yeah, slowly dying for a very, very long time. <laughs> it's kind of sad. <laughs> it is when you think about it that way. Lacey, take us through your day-to-day research in terms of what is it exactly that you do? Do you work with telescopes? Are you modeling on computer simulations? Do you have big maps behind you where you're you're mapping the sky? Um, Take us through, you know, your typical day as a PhD candidate. Okay. Yeah. Don't ask me to point to a map and tell you where anything is because I won't <laughs> even know, which is funny because when you're in astronomy, you, uh, you think that I would be able to, but I mostly do theoretical modeling. I also have, um, I do a little bit of observational work, mostly because I wanted to have the experience. And so I have been able to observe on the Keck telescope in Hawaii one of the largest ground-based telescopes in the world, uh, which was really, it was amazing that I got that experience. But what I mostly do is theoretical modeling to try to model the observations that we get from large telescopes. Mm -hmm. So since I'm, um, I'm a PhD candidate now and I've passed all my coursework and all the exams that are required. So now I'm just in the home stretch finishing up my research. I usually wake up, check my emails. I'll have some virtual research meetings. I do a lot of coding, which includes just analyzing data using, I use Python to code. So I'll just do, you know, statistical analyses in Python, or I'll use um, our supercomputer that I have access to remotely and I'll run atmosphere models using a model called Phoenix which has been around for a very long time. It's a sort of a state-of-the-art, well-tested, stellar and planetary atmosphere code. So that's what I use. It's in Fortran, so it's old. And then I do a lot of reading and writing, a lot of reading scientific literature, and then I'm currently working on my own research papers. And I just submitted one on Friday, so I'm waiting on peer review for that one, which is exciting. I've been working on the project for maybe three years. It's a big paper. (laughs) Thanks. So you mentioned uh, telescopes. Do you mostly use um, ground-based or orbiting telescopes? So for brown dwarfs, you you really do want to go to space because the atmosphere tends to cause issues when you get into the infrared wavelengths and brown dwarfs are brightest in the infrared. So you Mm -hmm. can use, and we do use ground-based telescopes as long as they're large enough like Keck and having adaptive optics on the telescope is, is very beneficial. And it's something that usually you need to get higher resolution observations. Um, the observations I use are from Keck and I also have some from the Hubble telescope, which is in space, of course, mm-hmm. and you can get some, um, yeah, you can get different, uh, photometric and spectroscopic bands from space. So okay. when James Webb launches, that will be awesome. Hopefully yes. that does launch, but <laughs> brown dwarfs, yeah, they're, um, they're very bright in the infrared, but they can be difficult to see. So you definitely want to use a combination of telescopes to get as much of the spectral energy distribution that you can. Before we talk about brown dwarfs more, more specifically, um, I, I have a lot of questions for you because you're literally the first person that I meet that's actually working on actual observation. And I feel like a, like a, like a 15 year old kid. I have so many questions. So when, awesome. you, <laughs> when you observe a star, for me, I always thought that you'd get the computer would generate images and it would generate the conclusions. But from what you're saying, you have to, you get data through probably forms of numbers 1010 and you just have to model it and get uh, and derive something out of this, uh, those data that you get. 
So what is the, how does the data look like when you get it? Is it like a huge Excel sheet with a bunch of numbers or is it in the forms of graphs and images and charts? Um, it's usually, I'm trying to think, I've only reduced data. Luckily, I haven't, I didn't have to reduce all the data for the project that I'm working on. It was already done, but they're essentially data cubes. And so they're, they're pictures and you have sort of the, the X and the Y axis and then the Z axis is, um, man, I don't even remember what it is, but it's, it's basically like a data cube and it's a picture. And from that picture, you can extract a spectrum to get information about the composition of the atmosphere. And, um, and then what I try to do is use pho uh, photometry. So photometry will just be like one point in a band, like a filter on a telescope. Uh, okay. So it'll be just one point. Or um, I also, the next project I'm transitioning to is using spectroscopy, and that will be multiple points in a band. And, and then what we do, since with brown dwarfs, we, we understand them pretty well, but the mm -hmm. clouds in the atmospheres make it complicated to, to understand what's happening to these objects as they cool and evolve. And so I specifically look at the clouds and um why so why do the clouds make it complicated what about them um sometimes the clouds are variable so we've we've learned on brown dwarfs that there could be multiple layers of clouds or clouds that are you know rotating around the body and make the object change in brightness over time mm -hmm. and so we want to understand what's going on with them and and that can make it tricky mm -hmm. okay that makes sense you know i did a lot of research um before this podcast you know i was trying to familiarize myself with brown dwarfs because all those were concepts that i had heard before you know from a video a youtube video somewhere but i really after doing you know watching a, few, a good hour of youtube videos on repeat um it's it's really interesting what's interesting about brown dwarfs is uh, how hard they used to be when uh, they we, they used to study them before they we had all those sophisticated instruments because they could look like a like a like a gas giant is that correct but then it's the mass is different and all those things so that got me to think how did the first observation of a brown dwarf happen did it happen more did it start with a theory and then it was proved through observations, like a black hole, for example, uh, where black holes were theorized and then we were able to get data about them? Or did it start with an observation and scientists sat around the table and they were like, this is weird, what is this? And then we came up with Ron Vorf. How How did it happen? Yeah, that's a good question. And you're exactly right. We theorized... Um, about these brown dwarfs before we discovered one. So I think it was in the 1960s that somebody put forward a theory of these brown dwarfs and said that, you know, they're probably out there and they're going to connect giant planets with low mass stars and they could make up a large portion of our galaxy. And then the first brown dwarf wasn't detected until 1995. So that's ago. when, mm -hmm. and, and that was sort of when the first exoplanet was detected too. And most of it is because as our technology increases and we are able to see more of space and have um, more missions and, you know, better telescopes, we were able to start detecting the brown dwarfs. So they were always lurking out there, but we just couldn't see them yet. How do brown dwarfs help us understand our world? Like, why is it so interesting? Why? Because there's a lot of, there's thousands of people like you in the world. There's thousands of instruments out there. There's millions of dollars being pumped into studying brown dwarfs, which is a very specific uh, thing in the universe. What is it that they teach us about how our universe works, how stars form, that we can somehow derive value out of it for humanity? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> yeah, there are um, 
there are a lot of things we still don't understand about giant planets, like even the planets in our own solar system, Jupiter uh-huh. and Saturn, for example. And there's a lot of effort right now in exoplanets and looking for another Earth and finding these Earth-like planets that orbit around these low-mass M-dwarf stars. And so brown dwarfs help connect those low-mass stars. How do they form with all the giant planets form? And it's sort of a missing link that tells us a lot about planet and star formation. And so a lot of similarities occur between brown dwarfs and giant planets. And the the brown dwarfs are brighter than a planet like Jupiter. So they can be, even though they're tricky to detect, they are going to be easier to detect usually than just a Jupiter floating out there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they're important because we can learn more about planetary systems and planet formation, which can answer questions about our own solar system. Um, A good example is there are theories that Jupiter actually formed much closer to the sun and migrated outward. And then when we started to detect all these exoplanets, we found what are called hot Jupiters, which are Jupiter mass planets that are very, very close to these low mass stars. And, you know, that's very different from our solar system. And so to answer those questions, we have to learn more about giant planets and brown dwarfs. Okay. Okay. I saw something freaky, actually. And it really, it really triggered my, my imagination. Um, so I was looking at the, do you call it frequency band when there's like the visible light range and the, the ultra-red? Uh, how... Yeah, how do you call it when you have the observation of the graph on the spectrum of light? The 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 um, the term. Yeah, the spectrum exactly. The the this this term. So I was looking at the spectrum of you know your typical brown dwarf, and I saw that in the visible light spectrum it's like almost zero, but then in the infrared it's like a spike. Like like for whoever is listening right now. Please go see this on Google. It's pretty freaky. It's like, that means that in the visible light spectrum, you don't see anything. There's basically the light, the the planet is, is, is emitting very little light. But then in the ultra red, it's like a spike into a mountain. So then this got me wondering, if you were to take a spacecraft and, and orbit a brown dwarf, what would you see? Like, would you see just something black in the middle of blackness? Like, what would it look like? I, I think the best way that I've read it described, like the warmer brown dwarfs would maybe look an orange or reddish because they would still emit some light in the in the optical. And then the cooler brown dwarfs would maybe be like more of a magenta in color. But if they're not emitting any light in the optical and the visible wavelength range, then we wouldn't be able to see them with our eyes. So I guess we need uh, infrared (laughs) goggles on our spacecraft to be able, or a good sensor system to be able to detect (laughs) them. But, you know, I study brown dwarfs, but I've never really thought about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is that kind of freaks me out too. But it's definitely very interesting. Um, something else that's interesting is brown yeah. dwarfs cover a very large range of temperatures too, and so the warmest ones are maybe around three thousand Kelvin, and they go all the way down. I think they might have discovered one that was like the temperature of a human body. So really, very very Whoa. cold compared to yeah the warmest ones. So the spectrum of brown dwarf temperatures and masses are very large. And so that's why they're so interesting because there are are so many different types of them. That's so amazing. For reference, is 3000 Kelvin uh, cool for for what you find in the universe? Like what's the temperature of of our sun, for example? 6000 Kelvin. I think our sun is about about double that. So about half. Um, last question about planets, basically. 
What are the differences between uh, brown dwarfs and red dwarfs and white dwarfs and other dwarfs out there? Yeah. Um, so brown dwarfs, I call them brown dwarfs, but um, sometimes they're also referred to as ultra cool dwarfs or sub just substellar objects. But brown dwarfs, that's what we've been talking about. If you hear red dwarf, that's going to be a low mass star. So like an M type star and the closest, one of the closest stars to us is an M type star. So red dwarf is just an M type star, uh -huh. very low mass star. A white dwarf is what happens after a star, the mass of our sun evolves and ends its life. It'll become a white dwarf. So red dwarf is like a tiny star. A uh, brown dwarf is these weird in between <laughs> objects. White dwarf, dead sun. <laughs> dead sun. Yeah, they're all dead in some way. Yeah. Uh, Lacey, what are your plans after pursuing your PhD? Do you have? Oh, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have had a really unique trajectory throughout my education and on this journey to get my PhD. And I used to want to stay in academia and pursue a career in research. But about three years ago, I found myself back to painting again. So uh -huh. I painted my whole life and I really got involved in space art. And so I see my future career as one that combines my passions of scientific research or science with my passion for art. And so I think that probably looks like some kind of scientific communication or science education career. I, I don't know exactly what the job is yet, mm -hmm. but I know it's out there and I'm going to find it after I finish my degree. I mean, look, if you've been able to find and identify brown dwarfs, you can find your next. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, that's career. true. <laughs> so um, the last thing, so you've, did you go into academia? Because you're you're hard into academia right now. Like PhD, I don't think there's anything more hardcore into academia than going through a PhD. Did you did you have any expectations coming in? And now that you're leaving, you're like you you're 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 you've changed your mind, or is it something that as you've developed as a person, as an individual, as a young professional, basically you've you were like, all right, that's cool, but. There's this other thing that I'm personally more attracted to. I used to think that I had to choose between science and art. And so when I entered my undergrad career at Purdue University in Indiana, where I'm from, I picked science. And I, I went through grad school because I, I have two masters. So during my first master's, I didn't do any art at all. And... Uh, you know, in the last three years, like I said earlier, that's when I realized I don't have to decide between science and art. I could combine them both and they are both important skill sets that I possess. And I think when I realized I didn't have to make that choice is when I realized that I didn't want to be just strictly in academia because I don't think I would have time to continue my, my paintings. So that's sort of what solidified it for me. Well, Lacey, you have my support and the entire support of the worldwide engineering community. Yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's always We're... scary to tell people that. Like, yeah. I don't want to do, I don't want to be in academia anymore, or I need a tiny break from research. There's nothing wrong with it. Lacey, where can people find, find about you, find your art, find your, you have a website, you have your Instagram, you're on TikTok. Tell us about that. I'm all over the place now. Well, you can find me. I'm on I'm on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, and I use the handle at Stellar Arts, but it's Stellar with an E, and that's not because I can't spell. It's because it's named after a type of bird that I like, a Stellar's J. I'm also a, a really big bird watcher, so I try to combine my love of birds and space to make my account name. <laughs> and I wonder sometimes if people just think I can't spell the word stellar and I study some stellar objects. That's not true. <laughs> cool. Lacey, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs>